Midnight's Children is the second of Salman Rushdie's novels, but even to call it a novel in a way is an error. Modern novels had plots, and unless history is a plot, God forbid, uh, <coughs> this work is not easily classifiable in that genre. It is restless in the extreme, part history text, part autobiography, part social theory, part poetry, part magic, part realism, part fable, part allegory, part Bollywood showbiz, and part lyrical epic. It is, with the other of his works, a new species of narration. It is pluricultural and multivocal, and responses to it continue to vary from the embrace of critics to the hostile. Rushdie, I am convinced, is clearly guilty of the sin of polyglottony. <laughs> Salman Rushdie has trained his traveled eyes, those of an expatriate, on one of the most convulsive events in modern history, the partition of India and Pakistan, a moment of idealized hope and simultaneously a moment of immediate extreme violence. He authored the continuing story with fascination and provocation while dreaming of an unlikely redemption for refugees everywhere. This is a parable and a metaphor for peoples of developing countries today, as well as those within fully developed countries with failed or even failing democracies. It is a story which is always urgent and never more so than today. I would like to turn this afternoon over to our instigator and ally in this venture, President Lee Bollinger, who had the vision and the fortitude to enable this large project to speed forward. It is his good grace that has allowed the many complexities of this challenging work to emerge to everyone's benefit. Join me in pleasure and in honor in welcoming Salman Rushdie and Lee Bollinger. So we're just going to have a conversation. None of this has been rehearsed. Uh, we have not gone over this. Salman says that he loves uh, unrehearsed uh, life, and we're going to do our best uh, okay. to make it as good as we possibly can. And I'm interested in really pursuing, uh, I think, uh, some of the great issues of the time and how your views uh, as a, a, a novelist and writer um, and public figure, uh, so to speak, to these, uh, and how you think about it. Now, I have to begin with this question. Don't you sometimes wish you were a lawyer? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I was supposed to be a lawyer. That was, that was my father's plan. Um, my, my father was a lawyer. He was qualified as a barrister in, in England, and um, clearly thought that that's what I should do. Um, I didn't. And when I left college and mentioned to him that I was thinking of wanting to be a writer, this, this kind of yelp came out of him, <laughs> which was completely, he, was, I mean, he wasn't trying to be horrible, but he couldn't help himself. He, <laughs> he said, what will I tell my friends? <laughs> and, um, well, I mean, having said that, after that, he was, he was supportive of of my trying to, to start out, but, um, <laughs> but it's not, you know, it certainly wasn't the plan. I mean, I think, you know, actually, I think I'd have been quite a good lawyer. That's, that's always been my hunch. But, I mean, I like arguing. <laughs> we'll wait to see till the end of this interview. With, with the, so I think one of the ways to, to frame this is uh, the fact that this is your second appearance at Columbia. And the first appearance was a really dramatic um, entry into Lowe Library. Mm -hmm. uh, on December 11th, 1991, some 1,000 days after the death threat against you. And this was uh, the first public appearance that you made uh, since that death threat. Mm -hmm. It was very dramatic, and it was on an occasion of the celebration of the First Amendment. And Justice Brennan was to be the, uh, the honoree. And you were the special guest. I was the surprise guest. You were the surprise guest. And nobody knew until that moment, really, that as you walked through a curtain, uh, that you would be there. And you received a standing ovation. 
And you gave a speech which I want to refer to because you say a number of things in there that I think are very revealing sort of about you and about life and about uh, great issues. And so if we could, I'd like to start with that and then end with sort of where we are now and use that as the time frame. And in a sense, uh, in a sense, this was sort of a birth. I know births are very important to you uh, metaphorically and fictionally. Um, and in this particular birth on December 11, 1991, the talk that you gave uh, was, if I were to use one word to describe uh, sort of the impression that you created uh, in the audience, it would be that you were feeling a sense of abandonment. Mm. Um, that here you were living in complete isolation uh, and terrible things had happened to you. And meanwhile, uh, friends had, had turned against you as well as um, uh, strangers. Things were being said about you that were extremely painful. And while you were also finding reason for hope, uh, there was the sense that uh, the rest of the world was going on about its business uh, and you were being treated as, uh, you described it at various points, as somebody in a bubble, unable to have real human contact uh, and sort of outside. And, and this, it, you concluded with, a, again, a metaphor of a balloon. You started and concluded. Um, and how you were sinking in this balloon, and uh, and people should, in a sense, reach out to you to, to help. Is that, I mean, this is your interview. I'm sorry to go on for so long, no. but it's a powerful, <laughs> it's a powerful set of theme. Is that consistent with how you felt at the time? Yeah, that was, I mean, it was a very bad time, you know, and um, it was probably the worst time, actually, because as you say, until that moment, I hadn't really been able to begin to fight back. You know, I'd really been uh, kept somewhat against my will out of the public eye and not, um, and you know, for, for a rather long period of time, hadn't been able to f fight my corner, you know. And, uh, and that's, that feeling of helplessness is very distressing. You know, and actually from that moment on, it kind of changed because I did begin to do that and immediately felt better. It was an amazing thing coming to Colombia that time because Everybody got very excited, the police, you know. Um, um, <laughs> and I, I got, I found myself being met I with an 11 vehicle motorcade, with me in the middle vehicle, which was a, a white armored vehicle, yes. right? So, and all the other cars were black, you know, I'm in the white one. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so it's like this is a very big neon sign. <laughs> the sky. Um, and the, the, the police officer who was in charge of the operation, I believe to be certifiably insane. And, um, and, and he, he was, I will identify only, uh, him only as Lieutenant Bob. Um, he had, you know, he talked into his sleeve a lot. And, and, and he was known for the day as Hudson Commander. That was his name. Roger Hudson Commander. <laughs> Will call you Hudson Lookout, yes, Roger, copy that, you know, all that. All that. Right. And so there we are. I mean, actually, my literary agent, Andrew Wiley, who was with me in this vehicle, said it was the greatest day of his life, you know, streaking down 125th Street in an 11 vehicle motorcade with the whole of Harlem on the street, and going like this. You know. um, for me, it was less pleasant, but I'm glad to have brought him some pleasure. Um, he. I said to Lieutenant Bob, I said, Lieutenant Bob, this is a lot, you know. Um, he said, it's what we do for Arafat. <laughs> At this point, I found out what it's like to be Yasser Arafat in New York, you know. Um, and I said, well, I said, supposing it was the president, you know, what, what, what would you do for the president? And he said, well, sir, for the president, we'd close down a lot of these side streets here. But in your case, we didn't want to do that because we thought it would look too conspicuous. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was just crazy. You know, there were snipers on rooftops. I mean, it was. But then 
as I say, from that point on, I did feel able to begin to, you know, to begin the kind of political and intellectual fight back against that threat. Um, and actually, to be true, you, you mentioned that, that I lost friends. Actually, I didn't lose that many friends, exactly. Uh, in fact, I had somewhat the opposite experience of, of my friends coming much closer to me and actually making friends as a result of the threats against me. There were some, I mean, there were some writers who, who broke ranks. I mean, there were really surprisingly few, actually. But I can count them all on the fingers of one hand, mostly. You know, John Berger, John Le Carre, and they've still got some fingers left over. You know, there's up there, there were very, actually very few writers who, who uh, rolled down um, children's writers. Um, I know. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Fascist, and right, see my right, right. right. <laughs> <You know, laughs> dead person. Um, anyway, he was nasty. But actually, the literary community on the whole was astonishing in its solidarity. You know, given that the literary community in general is not noted for its solidarity, you know what I mean? That it's a, that it's quite a, a, a separated, separated, you know, individualist and even infighting and rivalrous community, you know, but in, in this particular case, I think because people could see that something serious was at issue, mm -hmm. they actually did unite. But abandonment, you said. Yeah, I mean, politically, certainly, that was a moment where I felt nobody really had any energy to solve the problem, and, um, and that it was much easier to sweep me under the carpet and hope I went away, you know. Um, and that's, why, that's one of the reasons it took so long. I mean, interestingly, when the governments changed, you know, when, when there stopped being a conservative government in Britain, uh, and, you know, first Thatcher and then, and then John Major were replaced by the Labour government, um, the Blair government, and when, the, you know, Bush one was replaced by, by Clinton here, it really did change everything. Because suddenly, in both countries, there was a political will to resolve the matter. And as a result, rather rapidly, it was resolved. You know, and, what it and what it showed me is that it could have been done years before uh, if only anybody had bothered to do it. You know, but uh, I mean, I remember coming shortly after that Columbia visit, I was able to go to Washington to speak at a, a free speech event there. Um, and during that time, people tried to arrange political meetings for me at the George Bush Senior White House and um, completely failed. And, and that memorable figure, Marlin Fitzwater, um, announced that th he saw no reason why President Bush should, should meet me because, after all, I was just a writer on a book tour. <laughs> so so and that was the kind of characteristic attitude of that presidency. But it changed dramatically w uh, when Clinton came to power. So let me just pursue that for a second. I, I, I don't want to be too somber about this. Um, but when you read the talk that you gave, it has a, a solemn, very um, abandoned sort of feel to it. I mean, you, you talk about that your life, uh, that this had been a degree course in worthlessness. Um, and, and I'm wondering about the relationship of humor uh, and these feelings for you. And I'm interested in them. Uh, in how it translates into your writing and into your, because I, I think, uh, you, you know, there's a strong sense uh, in reading your uh, writings and in listening to you that it's somehow that combination uh, of really deep, deep issues um, and personal uh, things, uh, personal feel deep feelings. Uh, and uh, a sort of very airy, humorous sense of the world as well. And is there, would you say that's right? Yeah, yeah um, I would say that's right. And I, I think, yes, I'd forgotten having written that thing about, about the degree course in worthlessness. And it, it did, I mean, it strikes me as you quote it that I obviously was in quite a depressed frame of mind you know, to, have, to have written that sentence um, and to said that sentence. Um, but it was partly because it was, it's, it's hard to remember now because, because thank goodness life isn't like that anymore. Uh, but but there were, at that time, everybody had an opinion about me. I mean, everybody. Mm -hmm. um, and um, it, 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 the opinion was not based on 
on knowing my work or having met me or having heard anything I'd said or seen me on television or, you know, right. it was based on nothing, you know, and yet everybody had, you could have stopped, you know, a taxi driver in the street of any city of the world and said, what do you think of Salman Rushdie? And he'd had a, he'd have had a point of view, you know. Um, and, and that was an alarming thing to feel. Right. You know, just, just how did that happen, you know? Um, and many of those views were negative. Right. Um, and what was being published in the newspapers was, in many cases, and I'm not now even talking about a kind of Islamic attack. I mean, that's one thing, right? Or an Islamist attack. Right. right. That, that, that's one thing. Um, but just at the level of newspaper commentary, there was, people get tired of saying, poor guy, he's in danger. Right. You know, that, that very rapidly, people start looking for another angle. And the interesting angle is, what did he do? <laughs> you know. Right. As my English teacher, my, they dug up my old English teacher from, from high school, <laughs> um, who gave what I consider to be the best quote of the whole thing. Um, he said, who'd have thought such a nice, quiet boy could get in so much trouble? Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 and, um, and well, he's wrong about nice, quiet boy, but never mind. <laughs> uh, he, it was horrifying, mm -hmm. horrifying to have my character reinvented for me every day, 20 different ways, to have my motives described for me in ways which I didn't recognize, to have my integrity questioned almost by the minute, uh, to have my, you know, my writing torn to pieces in front of my eyes right. after you know, 15 years of working as a writer. Uh, to, to discover that suddenly you had no money in the bank. You know, that you'd been, I mean, the, the Static Verses was my fifth novel, my fifth book. Um, and so it wasn't that I just sort of arrived from nowhere. Right. You know? and, but it seemed as if I had. It seemed as if I'd, nothing I had done before existed. Right. And there was just suddenly this thing. I mean, this is, this is one of the things you say, you said. Um, after describing really the horrendous sort of conditions that you had been um, subjected to, uh, you sort of ask yourself uh, the question, isn't there something, you may think there's something I could do about this. So here's the paragraph. You may ask why I'm so sure there's nothing I can do to help myself. At the end of 1990, dispirited and demoralized, feeling abandoned, probably where I got the mm. word abandoned from. Even then in consequence of the British government's decision to patch things up with Iran, and with my marriage at an end, faced by deepest grief, my unquenchable sorrow at having been torn away from, cast out of the cultures and societies from which I'd always drawn my strength and inspiration, that is the broad community of British Asians and the broader community of Indian Muslims I determined to make peace with Islam, even at the cost of my pride, which I, I want to get to. But I mean, that certainly conveys as very powerfully uh, a sense of dislocation and abandonment. And so, and and when you think about what you, I mean, you think about Midnight's Children, you think about the partitioning, you think, uh, I mean, how much of this is of, of sort of critical importance to your view of the world? Well, I think it's, it's, it falls into the category of be careful what you wish for, yeah. you know what I mean? Because, because I think clearly the subject of dislocation, migration, fracturing, yeah. et cetera, it's, I mean, it's what I was writing about you know, long before right. any of this happened to me. You know, right. the, I mean, in Midnight's Children, when the doctor at the beginning falls in love with this woman through, who he sees only in, in bits through a hole in a bed sheet, um, that, in a way, that fracturing of the woman you know, um, and her assembly in his mind over a period of time, right. bit by bit, you know, he kind of glues her together in his imagination and then falls in love with it. Right. Um, that was, in a way, uh, also a, a figure of how the whole book was constructed, you right. know, as the world seen in fragments, you know, right. and, and then in some way united by the imagination of the, of the writer and yeah. also of the reader, you know. Um, so I was that in shame, there's a whole riff in there somewhere about, um, when I remember John Fowles has a, a sentence in one of his novels in which he speaks about how the only thing that matters is what he calls whole sight, you know? Uh, and he says, if you don't have whole sight, then all the rest is sort of meaningless. Mm -hmm. and, and I remember 
when I read that, sort of wanting to argue with it as a sentence, you know, because it seemed to me that one of the things we don't have anymore is whole sight. You know, the world has become too fragmented and disputed a territory mm -hmm. for anybody to be able to claim to see everything, to see everything. You know, um, that kind of Renaissance man idea of being able to have the whole of knowledge at your disposal right. you know, um, is no longer possible. Right. I mean, partly because there's too much knowledge, and partly because it's too argued over. Right. You know, we can't uh, we can't even agree about what is the case you know, anymore. So, so, so it seemed to me that uh, in ag against that Falzian idea of whole sight, I wanted to invent a kind of a kind of broken mirror, you know, a kind of fractured reality. Yes. Um, and to see what those pieces could show us, and then you know, and then it happened to my life. So of course, you know, it was. Uh, it was a very scary thing because one of the ways in which I can't remember if it was in that essay or elsewhere, but it felt like somebody broke my picture of the world. You know, we all live inside a picture of the world, right. which is which is how we think things are. You know, um, and if somebody smashes that, one way of describing that is insanity. Yeah. You know, if you if you don't have a picture of the world, you're sort of crazy. Right. You know, and and you have to begin to put it back together. You know, right. and that's. That's what I had to do in those years. Right. So um, one of the things that you speak to then and now, uh, and it, it just makes me extremely happy to hear you talk about it, is freedom of speech. And you have a, a statement in here which I, I just, I mean, it's just wonderful. Um, you say at the end of your talk in 1991 that uh, free speech is a non-starter, says one of my Islamic extremist opponents. No, sir, you say it is not that. Free speech is the whole thing, the whole ball game. Free speech is life itself. Um, and I wonder uh, if we could talk about that a little bit. Uh, that is, why is freedom of speech, what, what made you think that freedom of speech is the whole thing? Uh, and I guess the, the larger frame in which I, I would like to sort of pursue this is that a hell of a lot of the world does not think that freedom of speech is the whole thing. And one of the great issues of our time is to what extent will sort of Western values be insisted upon or imposed upon other societies in the world that do not accept those values. And liberalism has a kind of, and free speech has a kind of paradox in it because a lot of what freedom of speech liberalism is about is having very active imagination, being able to put yourself in other people's positions and so on. Uh, I mean, that's the basis of tolerance, and that's the basis of, uh, of a lot of what we take to be uh, Western values. Um, and yet there are some things that we think we should insist upon, and one of those is free speech. The very thing that has as its core sort of trying to understand other points of view is something we're not prepared to give up on. And that means, at the end of the day, we sort of have to have an argument for why that kind of value is something mm -hmm. that we should insist upon. And you take that position. Free speech is life itself. Uh, it's the whole ball game. It's the whole thing. Uh, and you, as the one of the most powerful symbols in the modern world of the denial of free speech, uh, because of the death threat, have a, a really a, a, a sort of an unusual perspective, it seems to me, on the importance of that. So I, what I'd like to invite you to do is to talk about why free speech is the whole ball game, why it is life itself, why it is something that we should insist upon. Um, how long have you got? Yeah, that's just, <laughs> um, it's just um, on the subject of the death threat, I just thought you know, in parenthesis it would be worth saying that that was one particular battle, hard as it was to fight, that in fact we did right. win. Right. You know, 
that they tried to suppress a book. The book was not suppressed. They tried to suppress the writer. The writer was not suppressed. Um, it's right. still, you know, it was a difficult battle. And I say we, I mean, you know, lots of people, but there publishers, were writers, but, readers. But a lot of people pay big costs, including you especially. Nevertheless, you know, right. good to win because the alternative right. was to lose. Right. Um, and, um, <laughs> and just, um, in, you know, in the matter of me right. and the Ayatollah Khomeini, one of us is dead. Um, but, uh, uh, but, but just that's in parentheses over here. Right, free speech. Um, that was an example of free speech. Uh, <laughs> um, here's what I think, first of all, why it became, became mm -hmm. I mean, you're right that I became, I was obliged to learn about free speech as an issue yeah. by the process of somebody trying to take mine away. And I think that's not that unusual because, you know, when there's enough air to breathe, it seems ridiculous to be carrying around placards to say how it's important to have air to breathe. Right. You know, because you've all got it. You know, so what's the story? What's the subject? You know, what's the beef? So when somebody starts turning off the air supply, that you suddenly notice that it's pretty important to be able to breathe, and you start making a noise about it, um, and. That's really, I felt, what happened to me. Somebody started turning off the air supply. Um, and I became suddenly extremely conscious of what I had previously just taken for granted. You know, I mean, the going in position, uh, writing the satanic verses, was this, was that this came out of material that was my life material and which belonged to me as much as it belonged to anyone else, and that I had a perfect right to approach it and write about it and explore it any way I chose. That was the going in position. There were clearly people who disagreed with that. So, but that made me, first of all, aware of how automatic that going in position had been, right. you know, and how, and the kind of strength of questioning that it then came under. Because you're right, there's plenty of people who don't think like this. Right. You know? um, and I guess I give you a theoretical and a, and a practical, and, and a kind of, as it were, uh, circumstantial answer. But I think the theoretical answer is, and why I said, you know, the whole ball game and life itself and so on, is not because of what, it, what, what you call Western values, because I mean, actually I don't particularly think of free speech as a Western value. Um, I think it's something which everywhere I've been in the world, people enjoy indulging in, right. you know, um, and don't like it when they're prevented to, uh, from doing so. You know, I've been, I've been in Pakistan during military dictatorships, people didn't enjoy that. You know, I've been in India during the Indira Gandhi emergency, uh, people were very, uh, upset about the, about the censorship, and they didn't feel that they were. So, so you think you you think freedom of speech is a universal well, that's, desire? I guess, I guess this is the thing: the question of whether there are such things as universal values. Mm -hmm. Is there such a thing as a human value, mm -hmm. which is not culture specific? You know? um, and and my view is that one way of approaching that question is to look at our actual nature as human beings. And what is it that is required for us to be the beings that we are? You know? and, and since one of the things we are is, as far as we know, the only self-conscious creature in the world, uh, the only one that is actually a bit able, able to discuss itself, to imagine itself, you know, and to have ideas about itself, and so on, it is very important for such a creature to be able to go through that process, which is a part of its essential nature. You know? Um, we're also, as far as I know, unique in the, in the, in, in the world uh, as being storytelling animals. You know, dolphins, as far as one knows, don't, deal, don't tell each other stories. Um, maybe they do. I, as Saul Bellow once said uh, about something else, you know, I'm waiting for the great dolphin literature. You know, and then, <laughs> and <laughs> so, you know, the case is not proven. Um, I don't, when I say storytelling animals, I also don't just mean that we write stories. I mean that in a way we define ourselves by stories. You know, an um, um, uh, example that I sometimes use about this is the family. Inside a family, there are family stories. Uh, knowing the stories of the family is an important part of belonging to the family. Um, uh, when you, and these can be very weird right. family stories which you don't tell outsiders so much, you know. <laughs> um, and when people, join the family, either when a child is born or somebody marries into the family or whatever it may be, 
gradually they are told the stories of the family, and when they know those stories, they are members of the family. Right. You know, um, and in the end, you know, inside the family, when we die and generations move on, what in a way what remains of us is a story. You know, we become part of that of that group of stories. So, you know, so we are people who exist in stories and by stories. Um, personally, not, I'm not talking about what writers do. I'm talking about what individuals do. Um, so, given that so much of our deepest nature centers around the idea of self-discussion and of description through story. If somebody tries to control that by deciding how you may speak and what you may speak about and what is permissible and not permissible, we simply, in my view, cannot be ourselves. You know? and, and that's why I think I would offer it as a human value and not as a culture-specific value. You know, but, that, uh, but, some, but some stories that people tell are very offensive to other people's yeah. stories. Yeah. Yeah. That's OK. That's all right. That's okay. I mean, uh -huh. I'm offended by all sorts of stuff. Uh -huh. You know, um, I mean, lots of stuff. And it doesn't mean you have to shut them up. You know, um, and this is and where. Let me say because this is the other thing I was going to say, that, which I think answers the question. This the practical example. Right. The thing that happened to me after the Khomeini fatwa um, in Pakistan was that there was a movie made about me, uh, a movie called International Gorillas. Um, <laughs> and and the International Gorillas were a kind of proto Al Qaeda group who were the heroes of the film, and whose job was to assassinate me. Um, I was the bad guy. Um, I was dressed in a very villainous series of kind of cerise safari suits. Um, and, and the camera always started at my feet and panned slowly upward. So, so, so there was a lot of safari suit. Um, very offensive to me, as a, just as a fashion note. Um, <laughs> um, um, Anyway, I, meanwhile, in the same film, was shown living in what looked like, you know, the Philippines, um, guarded by what very looked very like Mossad, right. you know. And I had a you know, whiskey bottle in this hand and a whip in this hand and was sometimes a sword. And there's a moment of high unintentional comedy in the film where one of the international guerrillas is captured, you know, by the Israeli Secret Service and is brought to my island paradise and is tied like this between palm trees, you know. And then I, you know, whip him and, 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 and you know, I, I, I torture him with my scimitar and, 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 and you know, drinking whiskey while I'm doing it and, <laughs> um, and in my serene safari suit. <laughs> and when I've done that for a while, you know, when I've sated, but I've slaked my bloodlust. Um, um, I say, or the character playing me says, take him away and read to him from the satanic verses all night. <laughs> and he goes, not that, anything but that. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> At the end of this film, in fact, I do get killed. So, you know, it's, it's sort of, it's, I get killed by a divine intervention, like a thunderbolt. Anyway, <laughs> I, I get fried. Um, so the film, you know, very offensive in many ways. And but when, when it came to England, uh -huh. well, they tried to bring it to England, and the, the distributors <coughs> went to get a certificate for it. And clearly, the, 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 what's called the British Board of Film Classification, the censors body, were given legal advice that the film is sort of 19,000 ways defamatory, and that if they gave it a, f a certificate, I could sue them as well, because they would become party to the defamation by giving it a certificate. Right. So they refused it a certificate. I then come into the problem that I'm fighting a free speech battle and being defended by an act of censorship. Right. Um, so I had to write a formal legal letter to the British Board of Film Classification foregoing my legal right uh, of suing. Said I will not take a lawsuit out. You must give this film a certificate, which they do eventually did, and the producers booked very big cinema, so two thousand seat cinema in in the town of Bradford in Yorkshire, which is the largest Muslim population in, in, in Britain, and nobody went. <laughs> Just nobody went. Nobody wanted to see a bad movie, you know. <laughs> and and, and I mean, had that film been banned. It would have become a hot video. It would have, its power would have been multiplied. Right. And, and it was a wonderful, to me, demonstration of the free speech position, which is that people are actually able to make up their own minds. That you can just put the stuff out there, even if it's offensive to you, you know, et cetera. And people, broadly speaking, have good sense. 
You know, it, even, if the, even if they're being told something about me, which they might in a way sympathize with, they still don't want to pay, you know, $10 to see a rubbishy movie. Um, and, and so, I mean, that, broadly speaking, became my view. Let, let it be there, you right, know, let right. it be there. The best way of arguing with it is if it's out there. Right. You know, ideas don't cease to exist because you suppress them. They're right. still there. So let, let's, let's come back to that. Let's move, let's take the next uh, sort of subject, which is very much related to that, and one of the, again, great issues of the moment and of the time, and that is the relationship of religion to political and social life. And I think many, let me just put it in a more a personal sense, I think there is a, I have the sense that, uh, that religion is, in any event, put it this way, there are very serious problems we are facing in the world from a too close connection between religious beliefs and political mm -hmm. life. And I, I w would like to ask you to reflect on that because, again, this is very much uh, a matter that you have written about, thought about a lot. In the talk at Columbia in 1991, you say that you were very much committed to a secular Muslim uh, uh, kind of view of the world mm -hmm. and life, uh, and uh, you're very concerned about the risks of uh, the sort of actually existing Islamic culture, uh, religious culture moving into political life, as you called it. Uh, what do you think about that? As, par as background, to, to, come from an, to come from an Indian Muslim background right. um, had, has two aspects, because of course Mus Muslims are a minority in India and not a majority community, so that's, that's a different experience right. than, than being in a country where Muslims are the majority or indeed are the whole population almost. So, and in India, the Muslim community always, from a very early point in the nationalist movement, accepted secular values because those were the values devised by Nehru and Gandhi as a way of protecting minorities you know, from the 85% right. Hindu majority. Right. Uh, and it was believed that if the constitution of India were to be in some way religious in, in character, I, you know, affected by, by the very large Hindu majority, that would be extremely destabilizing for community relations and so on. And therefore, the country should be secularist in order to protect minorities, of whom, of course, the Muslims are by far the biggest minority. I mean, roughly speaking, 100 million Muslims in India, roughly speaking, 850 million right. uh, Hindus, and roughly speaking, you know, 50, 50 million everyone else. Right. Um, so very, very big minority. And so you, if you grew up in an Indian Muslim family, you were quite naturally secularized. It wasn't, right. it wasn't a big subject. Um, and certainly, you know, in those early years, first two or to 25 years of Indian independence, when the Indian Congress Party more or less had the political support of the Muslim community, it was a very secularized support. Right. So there's that. Um, I mean, the other thing is that I just, I mean, I grew up in a family without much religion, just you know, at the ordinary level. And my parents didn't seem to be particularly religious people, and I'm grateful to them for that. Um, uh, because it just let me off a particular hook. You know. um, and it's, it was, well, how should I put this? One of the strange things to me, and I've discussed this with, with writers from all over the Muslim world, really, writers from Lebanon and Egypt and Syria, et cetera. And one of the things that we've been saying is if you look at the cultural life of the great cities of the Muslim world 50 years ago, mm -hmm. you know, look at it in the late 50s. Look at Beirut, mm -hmm. great city. Right. Great cosmopolitan city. Look at Damascus, Tehran, right. um, Lahore. You know, these were great cities with vibrant cultures. They were open cities. They had a, they had a culture of discussion and argument and disputation right. and etc. What happened? You know, what happened? This is an okay. We can blame superpower politics for for a share of that, and of course that's so. Right. You know. Right. But that's not the whole story. Right. You know. This is a, a story of cultural decay, which you can't escape if you look around what these, what these cultures were half a century ago and where they are now. 
you know, just I'm talking about culture. I'm not right. talking about, you know, economics or politics. I'm talking about how people live in a place. I understand. You know, um, and these were tolerant, open societies in a way. That, so in my lifetime, that decline has been, in my view, shocking. You know, I mean, having said that, religion and politics, that's not a subject exclusive to Islam. Absolutely. You know, I mean, last year, I was, I mean, for mysterious reasons, invited to Washington um, to, address, to address a group of Democrat senators and a group of Republican senators about, you know, the present discontents. Right. Uh, I mean, at that time, Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan and so on. Uh, one of the things that really struck me as a difference, cultural difference between the Democrats and the Republicans that I met, was that the Republicans spoke more or less entirely in religious language, more or less entirely, you know. Um, and that was a surprise, you know, uh, that it was so overtly a language right. of religious war. You know, con I don't mean an actual war, I mean religious conflict between cultures. I remember one of the senators saying to me with real anger, that the thing that really annoyed him about Osama bin Laden was that Osama bin Laden said that America was a godless country. He said, how can he say that? He said, we're incredibly godly. I said, well, Senator, I guess he doesn't think so. Um, <laughs> 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 and, um, but, so it struck me then that what was happening was a religious conflict of this side of right. the fence too. Right. Um, I, I, I think that's... I think that's absolutely right. I think everybody, th th there's fundamentalism in this country and it takes all different religious forms uh, as it does around the world. But I guess the question to be asked is at this point is given the turmoil uh, that the world seems to constantly be drawn into, uh, which has these religious sort of connections and where free speech and other uh, civil rights are, are uh, disputed, and you point to a kind of innate desire for openness and tolerance and a life that, that reflects that, do you think there is also an existential need that is not met by that kind of life? Yeah, yeah. I mean, and, I and that there's something in, uh, whether it's paradoxical or whether it's explicable or what, but the, I mean, there's, there's, it's not simply uh, a world where there are enlightened people with commitments to freedom of speech and secularism and so on, and then the rest of the world that somehow just doesn't quite get it. I don't think it is. No. Life is built, a lot more complexity yeah in this, and there are deep existential needs on the other side, too. Absolutely. Do you? I mean, reason uh -huh. is not enough. Yeah. I, mean, I think I myself feel the word spiritual should be outlawed for about 50 years. It just makes me think of naked Californians on mountaintops, <laughs> you know, chanting in Tibetan, you know, uh, in order to be in touch with the cosmos and so on. I mean, just ban it, you know. <laughs> so much for free speech. Right. I was going to... <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Believe me, I, I caught it, so yeah. go ahead. Right. Uh, but I think what's different is this politicized religion. That, that's, 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 a, that, that's a religion with the backing of right. highly organized political movements, um, uh, which, you know, after all, when they take charge in various countries, have been shown to be, first of all, not representative, and secondly, catastrophically bad at doing the job. So. In those countries where religion has actually taken over the government, right. you know, Taliban, Afghanistan, you know, Khomeini, Iran, it's a catastrophe. You know, I mean, look at Iran. Iran before the Khomeini revolution, I mean, you know, and I hold no brief for the Shah, by the way, you know, one of the world's great bastards and the, Brit <laughs> you know, and the British and the Americans fought, you know, the Shah. So, I mean, let's, I'm not trying to be, you know, what they, what we, what and I sometimes hear being called a Persian. <laughs> Uh, the Shah faction, you know, they're always Persians. Um, um, after the Shah, uh, at the time of the change, the time of the Khomeini revolution, um, Iran had, uh, Iran was a net exporter of food to the region. 
Um, it was it was you know, an extremely wealthy and developed economy, one of the most developed in the third world. It had a very powerful trade union movement. It had a, high, it had a highly developed feminist movement. Uh, it had a broad range of political parties, starting from the Communist Party and going to kind of free market capitalism on the other side. Um, it had a very highly developed educational system. Um, all these groups joined to depose the Shah. Right. And, and without, the, without all these groups co co uh, you know, combining, the Shah would not have been deposed. Right. And the tragedy of, Ira of Iran is that Khomeini ate the revolution, right. uh, that he basically destroyed all those people who had brought him to power in order to impose a very narrow society. Um, and since then, Iran is a, uh, an economic basket case. You know, a whole generation has been wiped out in a kind of useless war. Um, there are food riots because instead of exporting food to the region, there's no food in the shops for people to eat. Uh, the, you know, the economy is a catastrophe. Right. Um, so they can't run the country. Right. And that's, of course, why in Iran now they're very unpopular. Now, but if there is this um, sort of existential tension, I, I want to pick up on India and the sort of secular state of Nehru and, and a kind of state socialism versus the movements of the past decade, yeah. um, which are representative of changes throughout the world, and that is the sort of globalized free trade. Yeah. And the question is, I suppose, the question is, are you concerned on this kind of striving to resolve these tensions um, uh, we're talking about? Are you concerned? by what you see in societies that you know well, yes. by the shift to a market-based form of life. So that free speech is life itself, and that's become markets are life itself. Yeah, it's, you know, it's a big shift, as you say, because India came into being with a pretty protectionist economy, you know, tariff barriers around, um, with a, a, a command economy. You know where, where the government made these five-year plans, you know, on a rather Soviet model, uh, which the economy was then supposed to respond to, uh, with a lot of stimulation from above. Um, you know, things were done like, for example, I mean, famously, Coca-Cola was banned in India, so that local cola drinks, you know, could emerge. It was it became illegal to import foreign cars, so that right. there could be an Indian motor industry, right, um, and. And so on, right. and 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 that's how the country proceeded. Yes, for thirty years, more than non aligned, hmm? non aligned, and with a much closer relationship politically with the Soviet Union than with the United States. Right. Um, in those days, um, the United States used to rather suspect India because of that Soviet connection, and in Henry Kissinger's phrase, would tilt towards Pakistan, um, and. Um, that clearly was created mutual suspicion right. between between India and the United States. So a lot of which actually was dispelled with, uh, at the time of the Clinton visit. So that was a right. beneficial effect of that right. visit. Anyway, and then there's this huge shift, right. this huge, which is a shift that happened everywhere in the world. Too. That's right. The, the, the dropping of tariff barriers. Right. Um, the result of that, I wouldn't say, has been all awful. Yeah. You know, I mean, w just look at one of the benefits. At that time, in the time of the, of the command economy and the protectionist economy, there was very tight censorship of news media, uh, particularly broadcast media. You know, the, the print media were more or less allowed to function, right. but that's but the broadcast, the radio, you know, which everybody right. listened to, and television, as that became more important, was completely controlled. Then, along comes the star satellite, uh, Rupert Murdoch, right? <laughs> Um, beaming down, you know, CNN, MTV, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Um, and suddenly, there was a way for people in India to receive news information, right. which the Indian state could not censor. Right. And it completely transformed the nature of the Indian media, almost overnight. Yeah. You know, the, the ability, of the, ability of, the of the government to control information right. vanished. Right. You know, vanished overnight. And of course, then, then comes the internet and Enorm exponentially increases that, that, that thing. So, so there's a sense in which there have been clear benefits. There's also been an enormous quantity of wealth creation as a result of that. Right. The, 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 I mean, s stunning number of Indian millionaires. I mean, really quite remarkable number of people of great wealth in India now. And, and those people are generating a very powerful economy now, and, and particularly in new technology areas and so on. 
Um, but, you know, I mean, Bombay, for example, was always a city right. of great wealth <coughs> and great poverty. It was always, you know, the, the, the slogan, the cliche in Bombay was, the hov was about the hovel and the high rise you know, but next to each other. And, and that was always there. But now Bombay has unbelievable wealth. Is, is, this, and all unbelievable is this all unbalanced for the good, or you're, you're troubled no, by no, it? It's very disturbing because what it does mm -hmm. is it has that, that gulf, that mm -hmm. widening gulf between the rich and the poor, mm -hmm. is the thing from which populist crypto fascist politics has emerged elsewhere mm -hmm. in the world, you know, and, it, and it's, that's where it comes from. In India, I mean, if you look at the growth in Bombay specifically of the neo-fascist political party, the Shiv Sena, it, it grew entirely by understanding that the important thing was to work at the detailed grassroots level. You know, if you went to the Congress party and, you, and if you lived, you were a slum dweller. I mean, Dharavi is the biggest slum in Asia in Bombay. Um, it's not quite what people might think of as a slum. I mean, it's got roads, it's got electricity. You know, it has, it's got some plumbing in various places, standpipes and so on, you know, so, but people are living in shacks made of tin and cardboard, you know, and, and in very dreadful conditions. Um, if your standpipe stops, wor stops working, you know, there's no drinking water, nobody would dream of going to the Congress party guy because he only comes around at election time, you know, when he wants your vote. But the Shiv Sena guy would say, okay, and that afternoon there'd be a plumber around there and he'd fix the standpipe. This is exactly how the Nazi party started, mm -hmm. exactly how. Mm -hmm. um, and um, they understood that and, de and learned that lesson. If you work at the grassroots level, you're the guys who are there and deliver. You start building a power base. Um, then they actually structured themselves exactly like the Nazi party and, and you know, as using, I mean, Baal Thakare, the leader of the Shiv Sena, famously would have a picture of Adolf Hitler on his desk, you know, as a role model. Um, so. That's what happened in Bombay, and it's now it's it's created a degree of communal tension yeah. that never used to exist there, and it's very, extremely worrying. We uh, I have one more question, and we have to close. And I'm going to quote uh, one of your statements. This is the optimistic side of your statement: a self description um, in your talk at Columbia at Lowe Library in 1991. And the question I, I want to read this, and the question is: Do you still feel this is an accurate self description? Uh, you say. Um, yet I must cling with all my might to that chameleon, that chimera, that shape shifter, my own soul. Must hold on to its mischievous, iconoclastic, out of step clown instincts. No matter how great, no matter how great, no matter how great the storm, if that plunges me into contradiction and paradox, so be it. I've lived in that messy ocean all my life. I fished in it for my art. This turbulent sea was the sea outside my bedroom window in Bombay. It is the sea by which I was born and which I carry with me wherever I go. So that's not bad, is it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, one of the things, is, I guess this is the really last thing to say is that I think democracy, <laughs> freedom, art, literature, these are not tea parties. You know, these are not quiet, civilized locations. You know, these are turbulent, brawling, right. you know, arguing, abrasive things. You know, you don't, you know, a, a, a free society is not a society in which everybody neatly says, after you, no, after you, you know. <laughs> um, it's one in which people, I mean, if I, on that level, isn't it good that people in New York have started being rude to each other again? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, that after you, you know, after you, how you do, are you all right, all that stuff, I, that was, you know, <laughs> sort of bewildering. What's that about? You know? Anyway, so I've always seen all these related things, you know, democracy, freedom, literature, the world of the imagination, the world of the intellect, etc., as being turbulent places. And, you know, out of that turbulence comes work and, you know, out of those sparks, you know, fly, which are sometimes creative and sometimes not, you know, but without that turbulence, you know, in a calm sea, nothing happens. So, you know, let's have the storm. So, um, I want to say on behalf of Columbia, Salman, we look forward to welcoming you back 
in 2015, <laughs> 12 years after this. Thanks very much for this. Thanks.